Well, folks, after shop story number one, which I told you the crew had to talk me into that, they've now talked me into shop story number two on this Wednesday morning, and I'm running on about six hours of sleep over the last three nights. So if I forget bits and pieces or I sound like I'm half intoxicated, I'm giving you that warning right up front. This was a hunt in New Mexico. I don't want to dwell on my, on the noise. I live out in the country and who would think that the country could be this noisy at nine in the morning? So folks, if you hear any noise in the background, I'm just going, okay? I'm not worrying about my neighbor's biplane. I'm not worrying about Peggy over here on her bobcat. But anyhow, this hunt was in New Mexico and it turned out to be such a train wreck that it didn't even make TV. When I explain it to you, you'll know why I've tried to block parts of this out of my mind. I gotta start with a, kind of a confession here. And as you get older in life, you kind of realize how little you knew at earlier parts in your life, okay? When you're 30, you realize you weren't quite as smart as you told your old man when you were 20. And now that I'm 55, I look back and I'm like, you know what, Randy, you, you got lucky. and You confused luck with skill a lot of times in your younger days. So I bought my first bow in 1995 and I released one arrow between 1995 and 2007. So we started this platform in 2008 in the very first year I get a New Mexico elk tag and we go down there and I shoot an elk. Yeah, I didn't make the greatest shot. Damn it. We had to let him go that night because we lost the blood trail. Next morning we pick it up and finally we recover him. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's this bull right here. This is the first elk I ever launched an arrow at. And I'm thinking, you know, all those other elk that I called in or had close to me, I probably should have been shooting at those things. But I grew up in northern Minnesota with a dad who always said, oh, archery, that's how you wound things. Well, my dad never archery hunted, and he's a little bit opinionated. So I was left with this inside my mind concern that somehow archery equipment couldn't kill an elk. Well, guess what? Even with TV cameras along with me, I shoot this young six point bull. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, things aren't all bad when it comes to this archery elk hunt. Maybe it's not all as cracked up to be. 2010, I draw another uh, elk tag in New Mexico. I end up shooting a bull. I, I climb up on this rock from right up above him. I was, uh, I, I don't know how long we had to stand there, but TV required that you couldn't shoot a bedded animal. The elk is bedded right below me. There's his antlers right there. And Troy has given me this no way. And finally the bull stands, and you've seen this, I shoot the bull. Spot and stock, two yards. Oh my God. <laughs> I am a lucky guy. And that's this one. So, now here I am in New Mexico, two for two on elk. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, this, there's, there's not a whole lot to this, this elk hunting, man. Look at that. They, I mean, even shot one with seven points on one side. I'm thinking I really know what I'm doing. Then I, I really get full of myself because the week before this hunt we're going to tell you about, I'm here in Montana with my camera guy, Troy. We helicopter into this remote BLM piece that was, it was up for a land exchange. And I wanted to prove to people that, you know what? This, just because it's isolated, doesn't mean that people aren't hunting it and that it's not good hunting. And so I went in there and showed the world that you can go in there and shoot one. And so 
my third archery elk hunt with cameras, I shoot this bull. So if you can imagine, now I am really starting to think I've got this gig figured out. I have this New Mexico tag in my pocket the following week. There used to be Merriam's elk down in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. They were considered a huge subspecies. They're now extinct. In my mind, I was thinking I'm going to find a Merriam's elk. That's how confident I was that I was the guy. I mean, I'm three for three, man. Who? If you're three for three with TV cameras with you, you've got it figured out. Or so I thought. I don't know squat diddly about elk hunting. I know a little bit and I get to go a lot and we have some success, but the moral of that story is whatever you're gonna approach in life, don't confuse getting lucky, like these three bulls were, with being good. Well, a little more background to give you the context here is in 2011, I was using this production company and they had to bring on new camera guys because they took on this project. If you've ever seen it on the History Channel, it's called Mountain Man. Marty the Trapper in Alaska, Tom a Trapper up here in Northwest Montana. That was my production company that still produces that and they make amazing content. Well, so much of their crew got allocated to Mountain Man because they had to three or four characters, they had to have crews of two to four guys in each spot. So they set out on a search to find me replacement camera guys. They get me this camera guy, and I'm not gonna say his name, and you'll know why once we get through this, but he's supposedly a big shot, got his college degree in film, and he's a mountaineer, I don't know, he climbed the highest peaks on the moon or something, I don't know, he's pretty full of hot air, which, Anytime someone starts kind of broadcasting their accomplishments right away, I'm like, hmm. I'd actually met him at a trade show. He, he liked to hunt, and so he came up and talked to me. And so when they told me who it was, I'm like, well, that'll probably work. I had him on a New Mexico archery antelope hunt with my buddy Bryce about oh, a month before this hunt that I'm about ready to tell you about. That was his first hunt we ever had him on. Well, we're sitting there. And Bryce says, Randy, that looks like there could be a tornado coming with that storm. And so I tell the camera guy, I'm like, hey, get out of the tent, man. We, we got Dorothy and Toto are going to come flying by here any minute. And what does he do? He pulls his, his cot out of the wall tent and he goes over underneath a pinion tree there and he keeps sleeping. And Bryce and I are just doing everything we can. The wind's blowing the tents over. So we get the tents put away and... Just as we close the trailer door, here comes the monsoon. So that kind of gave me a little bit of concern about this guy. Then we go to Arizona. He's always late. He's disorganized. And if you know how much I like hunting pronghorn, and I burned 16 points for this tag in Arizona, I'm, I'm not real tolerant of uh, being late. If you can't get the mattress off your back in the morning, man, that is not my problem. I'll leave you. I've left lots of people if they decide that they're going to be Rip Van Winkle and sleep through the hunt or something. He's a nice guy, and it's easy to get along with him. But, you know, this is work. This is, we, we got a lot of money invested in these things, and we can't have somebody sitting there with their thumb in their ear. That, that's kind of the lead up for what this, this is the next big piece of the story. I'd left my truck down in Albuquerque. I fly down to Albuquerque, I grab my truck, and I head out to the hunting unit, and I'm gonna meet the camera guy out there on Saturday morning. So I tell him, look, I'm gonna meet you in Magdalena, because once you get far from there, you're, you don't have any cell coverage. So I'm out there, and I'm waiting. Call him, don't, don't get him. So I leave a message, it's like, hey, I'm gonna go out and scout today, and leave me a message when you get this. So I go out and I scout that day. I'm just running all around the, the area, just doing all I can to try to find where the elk might be, checking water holes and other stuff like that. So I come in that afternoon, call again when I get to coverage, no answer. I'm like, well, I'm gonna go out and scout this evening. Go do that. Sunday morning, 
no one's around. I told him where I'd be. It's, I thought maybe he'd pull in that night. No. Nope. So I call again. Hey, I'm going out scouting this morning. I go out. I find this really big bull. I'm like, this is it. I knew I, knew I had this elk hunting figured out, man. I am going to kill that great big bull right there. I mean, he's bigger than that one I shot in Montana just the week before. I'm pretty excited. So come back into town. Still no answer. So I leave him another message. All right, I'm going back out to scout. I get back into coverage and I call, don't get anything. Finally, I'm getting ready to cook my dinner and he calls me and he says, uh, I quit. I'm like, what, what do you mean you quit? He said, well, I, I'm not getting paid enough for how hard of work this is. And in my mind when he said that, I'm thinking these first two hunts were antelope hunts. I could film an antelope hunt from a lawn chair. And he thinks he's working too hard? He's like, yeah, and I think you're just trying to jack my hunting spots. What? I mean, I don't know how old the guy was, 21, 22. I'd been hunting New Mexico before he was in kindergarten. Jack his spots. I got a film permit. I can only hunt where my film permit is for. <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever. Get the hell out of my hair, you know what? The thankful part is, you're quitting before we get into the hard hunts of the season. Well, I know his boss really well. He's a good friend of mine. So I get on the phone, I'm like, yo boss, did you know your guy quit? Well, the boss man says, you know what, Randy, this is really gonna be complicated because I don't think we can get you a, another camera guy until probably Wednesday evening. So you're gonna miss the first three days of this six day hunt. I'm like, well, I came here to film. You guys know me, this is my job. I'm here to get content. I'll just go and scout every day. He said, well, I think I can convince Lauren. He can reshuffle everything Tuesday night and we'll get him on a plane. He'll be in Albuquerque sometime Wednesday afternoon or evening. I'm like, all right, that gives us Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the last three days of the season. We're, we'll, don't worry, we'll get this done. I don't have a camera to film any of the scouting stuff. I, I treat cameras kind of like my handyman skills. I can do it, but I don't like to. I've had their job before and I don't like it. So I get up the next morning, I go out to that spot where I'd seen that big bull and I'm up there, oh gosh, I don't know what time of day. It's right at daylight and I hear four or five bulls down in this basin bugling, working their way up the ridge. So I started hiking out there and it's that big guy with about four or five cows and he's got a bunch of satellite bulls trying to steal his cows. And I'm like, jackpot. You know, here it is opening morning and there's nobody around. No one knows he's in here. Cool. So I go back to my truck and I look in the back on the, on the driver's side and there's a nail in the sidewall. I mean, like a big nail. I'm like, how in the hell do you get a nail in a sidewall? Oh, well, change the tire, head into town. Businesses come and go a lot in Magdalena. Restaurants, and in this case, tire store. Eurasian collar dove that's hooting up in that tree right there. If Clark wasn't home, I'd be eating Eurasian collar dove tonight. But I don't know. Hopefully the audience can't hear that. Hey, Aries, go home. My neighbor's dog here coming to check us out. So, oh well, he's a good dog. Anyhow, I'd, I'd come into Magdalena and I gotta find a tire joint. And I'm coming in from the west side of town and I look and I see this little new tire operation. It's, it's not much of a thing. It's like an old rundown tin shop with few tires out on a rack. And I pull up there and I look and here's some, some old boy sitting in a metal rocking chair out there in the shade and he's just rocking. And then I look inside the shop and there's some big old boy, big, big stout dude in there. He's working on tires. I'm like, this is my kind of store. I'm gonna go see if these boys can, they can help me out. So I park my rig and I drive over or walk over and the old boy sitting in the rocking chair, he's like, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Over on that side there, you got a spare that doesn't match the rest. I'm like, yeah, you got that right. 
the younger guy, the big stout guy comes out and uh, he sees that I'm wearing my camouflage because I've been out scouting and, well, should have been hunting, but scouting and season's open and everyone in Magdalena knows when hunting season's on. Asked me if I'm hunting. I'm like, yeah, I'm hunting. And he said, uh, you, you, you can't drive a nail on a sidewall of a tire like this. Someone put that in there. I'm like, ah, nah, just bad luck. He's like, all right. He said, I'll fix it for you. Take me about an hour. I got a couple in front of you here. Okay. So it's about, I don't know, 12, 30, 1 o'clock. And I look over, and a few years earlier, I'd been to this little restaurant. They had really good food. And I thought, well, this is, this is a perfect time to go over and get some great New Mexico homemade food. My tire will be fixed. I'll be out scouting again this evening. I'm using this optimism idea that, you know what, make the best of, of bad situations. And little did I know, this was the pivot point of the whole hunt. This is where the greatest of intentions, the highest level of excitement, eases into the story and heads it down a path that you could have never imagined. I go to the restaurant and I go in there and there's a few locals around. You can tell locals in New Mexico, you know, they'd look like they've been out moving cows all day. And how you doing, how you doing? Sit down. And on the, the little whiteboard up there, it says five alarm chili, homemade cornbread, whatever the special was. Well, I'm a chili connoisseur, man. If I go to a restaurant I've not been to before and they have chili on the menu, I'm ordering the chili. The only edible fast food I've found that won't destroy my guts is chili, Wendy's chili. So when I see five alarm chili, and I know how good the chili is in New Mexico. And I know they have a whole variety of chilies there that are like authentic. In New Mexico, you drive down the road, there's chili stands where, where they get, you know, like the hatch chilies and stuff. Well, the waitress comes over, I get a glass of water and she says, uh, you know what you want? I'm like, yeah, I want that five alarm chili. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, oh yeah, I, I like chili. Some might say that she was you know, profiling me. No, I, she just was a smart waitress who could assess the situation and realize that a, a Scandinavian from Northern Minnesota is not built for this kind of chili. She takes my order and she goes in the back and out comes the cook, the chef, the, the master of chilies. And he's looking at me and he's like, I don't think you want five alarm. I'm like, yeah, I do. He said, uh, it's really, really hot. I'm like, I don't care. Bring it on, you know. I like chili. We're having a discussion, and he's trying to be polite. So he asked me how the hunting has been, and I told him, well, I produce TV, and my camera guy quit, and I got a flat tire, and so I, and that's the circumstances that led me into your restaurant here on opening day of elk season. He said, I'll make you a deal. I'll mix you up a batch that's maybe two alarm, three alarm at the most. And if it's not hot enough, I'll bring it back in there and we'll pour the coal to it. All right, bring it on out. I told him I want the biggest bowl. I said, I'll pay extra. He brought me out a bowl like a dog dish, man. It was like big. They brought the cornbread out and the butter is melting off it. I'm thinking, if I don't kill an elk, this is going to be worth it. Because I love chili and cornbread. I start wolfing down this bowl of chili. And it's one of those things where it's so good that you can't not eat it, but it is so hot. You shouldn't be eating it, at least if you grew up on a steady diet of tater tot hot dish and, and casseroles with cream of mushroom soup. That's the width of a palate of someone who grew up in northern Minnesota. So the waitress, she comes over and she sees like, I'm, I'm about ready to break down here. I'm just sweating like a hillbilly out of hoedown. Man, I am really struggling, but there's still a little bit left in that dog bowl there. So I told her, I said, can you bring me a really big glass of milk? She's like, yeah. She brings me a milk, water. And I'm biting the ice cubes out of the water, crunching them up and just laying them on my tongue. But now my whole gullet is on fire. It's like I drink battery acid or something. I'm like, whew, holy cow, this is not good. 
But man, it sure tastes good. So not wanting to make a scene there and just sweat into a puddle of perspiration right in the restaurant, I thought, well, I'm gonna pay and get out of here. I'm gonna go see if I can get my tire. Get up, I pay, I leave a nice tip, thinking, man, these people are, they're so nice. They thought of me, they probably saved me from myself. Walk out in kitty corner across the way is a tire joint, and I start walking over there, and I'm starting to feel something in my stomach. It's not good. First of all, I've never had this much pain in my stomach before. And even when I've had lesser pain in this stomach, the outcome was bad. So I go over and I ask uh, the big old boy there about my tire. He's like, oh yeah, I got it. And uh, he's like, let me put it on here for you. And my stomach's starting to hurt now. I'm thinking, nah, just throw it in the back. He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna put it on there for you. Cause I'm worried that I'm gonna have some sort of gastric event right here. And I'm looking around and this tire shop, if they have a restroom, I don't see it. So I'm holding my breath. And the guy asked me, he's like, you okay? I'm like, mm, I don't know. So he gets my tire on and I start driving back out west. And if you've ever been out where the VLA is, it's the very large array is what VLA stands for. And it's on the plains of St. Augustine. There are no trees there. And I got to cross that thing to get to the elk hunting unit. And I'm thinking, you know what? Bad as my stomach is feeling right now. I don't think I'm going to make it across this 15 miles of flat, just nothing. I mean, it's an old dry lake bed and it's just grass. I'm like, this could really be bad. So I do a U-turn and I go back cause I just come off this little hill and there were some trees back on this section of BLM. And I'm like, I better just make a U-turn and sit there in case I have a problem. I got my air conditioner on full blast. I'm drinking bottles of water. I, I turn off. And I've been down this road before, so I know there's a little grove of taller trees that provide some shade. I thought, well, I'll just go lay there and see if this passes. Well, I pull in there, and this isn't going to pass, folks. What do they call it? Too much information? But I think most people have been there. So I stop my truck, get the shovel, the TP, and I start walking over to these trees that are, you know, 100 yards away that could maybe hide my defiling of the landscape and I can't get there. I find one little pinion tree bush about this big and that's all I got for cover. I, this is, I don't know what it's like to give birth to a baby, but some women have said, you know, sometimes it's coming, there's nothing you can do about it. Where the baby got born right there in Walmart. I take one little step on the shovel, create a little hole and not good. But the embarrassment if someone would have drove by was nothing like the pain. I felt at that point like I was riding bareback on a belt sander with no underwear on is what it felt like. I don't know if I was howling and screaming, but usually in that amount of pain, I howl and I scream. And I'm thinking to myself, I could die out of here. At least they'll find my truck. They'll wonder what he died from. Once I game Oregon Trail, they say you died of the dysentery or something. I would be the first guy in recorded modern history to die of dysentery out in the BLM lands of New Mexico. I'm thinking, you know, I better finish my business here and quit being so obvious. I mean, if, it, if a vehicle would have drove by, I'd stand out like a turd in a punch bowl right there, man. I'd like... Me and my pale white Scandinavian skin as it is, the, my butt's probably even whiter. So I get my business taken care of and get my britches back on. And uh, I start walking towards my truck. And I, all of you have had this before too. All of a sudden, phase two. You don't know when phase two is coming. It might wait 10 minutes, two hours, or it might wait 30 seconds. In this case, it's less than 30 seconds. But I do the mental calculation that, you know what, if there's gonna be a phase three and a phase four, I gotta get further away than this little bush here. So I grab my shovel and my TP and I'm like some sort of hurdler heading across the landscape over to those taller trees because this could be a longer session. 
So I get over there and now I dig a, a hole that I'm thinking, well, I might die. Maybe I should dig a hole big enough that they could bury me in. Or I guess maybe I'm just going to fill it up. I got the hole dug and you know how it comes and goes, right? It's like the pressure is really intense and then you're like, Phew, maybe that was just a false alarm. And then here it comes again. It, again, I don't know what, what contractions feel like when you're having a baby, but this is... This is the closest replication I can think of. And here comes phase two and, and I'm back there and phase three and phase four. By now I'm, I, I'm, I, it hurts to even think about it. But I get done with about phase 12. Finally, I'm catching my breath. I'm exhausted. I feel like I've just done the decathlon the dysentery decathlon in the course of about 30 minutes. And so I grab my shovel and what little bit is left of my TP. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. I'm down to like three square of the TP. This could require me to take off a shirt sleeve or a sock. So I, I, I canceled the afternoon. I was like, I, I can't do this. I, I cannot go and scout this evening for two reasons. One, I'm exhausted and wore out. I'm dying and I don't have any TP. So when you come back into Magdalena, if you've been there, there's the gas. First thing is the old gas station on your right. And then there's the Dollar General store. I will in there, man. I'm I'm doing like the, the dysentery shuffle at this point. Uh, my butt hurts so bad. I'm taking these little mini steps. Like uh, if you go to the, the old folks home and they kind of shuffle their feet along, I don't dare lift a leg far enough off the ground because if I create a weakness in the pressure points there, I could have a problem right here in the Dollar General store. So I'm shuffling along and See these camera guys when I tell this story, he, Jonathan's over there laughing. Uh, how am I supposed to tell this story when you're laughing? So I'm shuffling through the dollar store and uh, I get to the TP and I'm, I'm as particular about TP as I am with uh, chili. And all they have is this industrial strength stuff, borderline cardboard. Well, I don't, I don't buy that stuff. I mean. My uncle says that this low quality TP, he says it gets all of the new and some of the old. And I just don't do that. And I'm thinking about how sore my bottom is. It's like, I need the, I need like 14 layer Charmin aloe coated or something. So I leave the general store without any TP and this is a risk. I'm staying in this little motel down the road. And forgive me Lord, I lied when I went in there and told them I was out of TP. I wasn't out of TP. Quick as I wheel in, I don't even go to my room. I go into the little desk, ring the bell. I'm like, I'm out of toilet paper in my room. Oh, well, we're sorry. They bring me out two rolls of really nice TP. That was to put in my pack. Maybe you got to drive to Socorro to get high quality TP. But in my mind, I'm doing the mental calculation that the amount of TP that's going to go across my bottom side in the next two days means that I, I can't use this sandpaper stuff. So I'm sorry that I lied to him. I should have left extra money for a tip or something, but a guy's got to do what a guy's got to do. So I take a cold shower. I come out and I can't even put clothes on. I'm still so hot and my bottom is so hot. It's like hurts. I mean, you know when you have back pain, if you cough or sneeze, it just is like radiating pain? Well, that's the kind of radiating pain that's coming from a very sensitive part of my body at this point. I called my wife and said, honey, I could die here in New Mexico. Whatever that lining is in your stomach, the bacteria that's supposed to help with your stomach lining and in your intestines, it killed it all. It's like putting Roundup on your petunias or something, man. That's what this chili was like going through my stomach. It, it just killed everything. I said, I'm in pain. I, I, I am hurting so bad. She's like, well, maybe you should go to a doctor. I said, well, I don't think they have a doctor in Magdalene. I'd have to go to Socorro, and I'm afraid that I don't have enough TP to get the 40 miles from Magdalena to Socorro. So what I did, 
so exhausted. I took the fan and I pointed it at my bed and I laid face down bare naked with the fan blowing on my butt. And that's how I went to bed that night. And unfortunately, I got woke up quite a few times with phase whatever, 12 or 14 or 20. The next morning I get up, I can't really walk. I, it has burned every layer of dermis off my bottom side. So I go over to the little check-in at the hotel and they have 24 hour coffee going on. I drank a bunch of water before I went over there, but I thought, I'll try some coffee. I tried some of these little whatever pastries they are. That was a mistake. Coffee's a diuretic, and when amplified with five alarm chili, doesn't take long for it to work. I don't need to go into more details of all this stuff, but suffice to say, my mobility is impaired to the point where I cannot take a stride more than a foot. I try to blow my elk bugle that morning. I mustered up enough strength to walk about 200 yards from the trailhead. And I thought, well, I'm not walking up that ridge if there's no elk there, so I'll try to bugle from here. You know, you use your diaphragm to kind of control that breathing and you gotta really tighten your core area and ease that air out of there. Well, as air comes out this way, it can create possibilities of problems going the other direction also. So feeling that I could be evacuating my intestines by blowing real hard, my bugles were like, <laughs> it's like, oh my God. I mean, I'm not a great elk caller to start with today, even after years of practice, I'm, I can get by. Back then I was even worse. And when I'm not allowed to give it the full horn, it's really bad. And so I didn't, I didn't hear any elk that day. It's really hard to drive on those rough forest service roads in your Nissan Titan with one hand kind of like keeping your butt off the seat and trying to drive and you know, it's like, whew. So I went back to the hotel, slept again that afternoon. I didn't eat anything. I didn't have the courage to go back to the chili, chili joint and ask them for something other than chili because I bragged pretty hard about my chili preferences when I was in there that day and I just, I went to, the dollar store because they, they don't have much for a grocery store in uh, Magdalena or they didn't at that time and the, I'm thinking I got to get something to eat so I bought stuff that I thought would serve as the best as we call it sometimes we call it butt putty uh, trying to clog you up a little bit more so you know liquid cork or whatever you want to call it something that kind of puts an end to the the transpiring story that's killing you. Well, they didn't have anything in there that was really edible. So I didn't eat anything that day. I think I had a Snicker bar or something in my pack or a protein bar. So I go back to the hotel that night. I'm just so tired that even in the pain, I can still get some rest now. You, you reach a certain point of tired where pain doesn't even affect you. But I'm relieved because I know Lauren is coming. And, uh, I got to run to Albuquerque the next day, so I, I jump in the truck. I don't do the coffee and the little pastry thing because I don't want a repeat of Tuesday morning. I just do my water. I think I found another protein bar for breakfast, and I drive out, and I'm scouting and listening, and I can hear some far-off bugles. I'm like, okay. Go back to the spot where I'd seen the big bull with his satellite bulls, and I can hear bugling up in that basin. It's like, all right. Maybe my bottom side is going to be healed up enough that I can walk up that ridge tomorrow. Because right now, I don't think I could do it. And uh, head back to town, prepared to head to Albuquerque to pick up Lauren. And I leave a little early because I know there are true grocery stores in Socorro. And I go in there and I buy a whole bunch of cinnamon and raisin bagels. Some of the best form of butt putty I know of is a cinnamon and raisin bagel with a bunch of peanut butter and jelly on it. So I go in there and I don't know how many I bought, but a lot. Then what I know Lauren would, would take, 
and uh, I pick him up at the airport and he told me, he's like, you aren't looking that good, are you okay? I'm like, no, Lauren, I'm not that good. And I'm telling him this story of this chili ordeal and how it's affected me. And he's, as a good friend, he is trying not to laugh hysterically in front of me, but he can't not laugh. He is an optimist of the greatest degree of, well, you know, some things are just meant to be. Maybe, you know, maybe you resting up, maybe that will make your legs a little stronger. Or whatever. You know, he's trying to come up with all these reasons why my need for aloe gel on my bottom in great doses could somehow benefit us on this hunt. So we stop in Socorro on our way back, get the rest of our groceries, and now we go to Magdalena. We're going to have to have separate rooms because I'll keep you up all night. I, this, this gastrointestinal inferno I have here gets me up like every two hours. We get up and we go out to this spot that I'd heard this big bull and seen him. And <clears throat> in the dark, we hear him just ripping it, man. He is just going to town. And I'm thinking, Phew. those three days of scouting and kind of tending to my, my GI tract are gonna pay off. Lauren and I are walking in there in the dark and he asked me, he's like, what do you have in your pack? Because normally I run with a pretty thin pack. Well, I had like four rolls of toilet paper, a bunch of extra bagels, some Imodium, some uh, every sort of stomach Pepto you can think of and an extra set of underbritches in case something went snare wire on us out there. And he starts laughing. And we're walking up the hill and the more we walk and the more he sees me doing kind of the dysentery disco there on the way I'm walking, he's laughing harder. And <laughs> he's trying to comfort me mentally. Uh, but I'm in so much pain and I'm still sweating. But at daylight, we look down and we see this bull working up this ridge. He's got four or five cows again. And there's, this time I think there's two satellite bulls with him. And it's far away. And so we start working our way over there. And as we do that, there's this little knoll. And the wind says, all right, Randy, go this way and intercept them. Well, they're coming up. So I start going this way. And as I get over on that side of the knoll, now the wind is completely wrong than it was over on this side. So I got to pull back and I'm waiting here. So I let them get past and the knoll's right here. And now we're kind of following behind them 100 yards, 150 yards in this really thick stuff. And what do they do? They come around the knoll and if we would have stayed right where we were, they walked right in our tracks where we'd first made our move. But it was pretty exciting because this guy was really letting it go. From that point on, that was the only good encounter we had. And that wasn't even that much of an encounter. After that, all you see for footage is us in this really thick pinion juniper stuff with an antler tip or a leg or the rump of an elk. And elk bugling at us from 50 yards and you can't even see them. I could go on and on about the story of, you know, some of the strange characters we ran into out in the wild. One guy tried to tell us that there's, New Mexico has bears that eat people. He said, yeah, we've got beehives out here this big, and those bears are tough enough to go eat those beehives, don't even phase them, and then they eat people too. Mm, okay. it, it was just the weirdest hunt. Lauren and I, after that encounter, we go back to the trailhead, and I told him, I said, yeah, I <laughs> came out here the other day, and..." I had a nail in the sidewall of my tire and the tire dude told me that he thinks someone put it in there. Lauren, he says to me, he says, as you're walking towards the truck, start explaining all the things that you could blame this hunt on. I'm like, well, I don't really want to blame anybody. He's like, no, it'll make a good clip. So I'm like, okay. So I start walking towards the truck and I'm rambling on about, oh, I could blame the weatherman. I could do da, 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 whatever. Well, trying to figure out who I can blame this on other than myself got the cameraman I could blame him if this doesn't come out right I could blame the editor about the final draft I could blame an equipment manufacturer could blame it on other hunters could blame it on the weatherman uh, could blame it on the production coordinator and I get to where I can see the truck and there's another flat tire in the back 
I'm like, you got to be kidding me. That tire going flat. I hear anything? So Lauren, he comes walking up behind me, and I'm pointing to the tire. I'm like, look at this. Maybe, maybe that guy is right that someone doesn't want us here. I get feeling, and I look, and it looks like a screw of some sort in my tire. Same trailhead. I leave the truck, no flat at all, but I come back two different days and I got a flat tire. Every elk hunt I go on, it seems like I gotta change at least one tire. We got footage of me changing tire and all the commentary that comes with that, but he wouldn't let me swear, which in my family, flat tires and cussing are like, you know, peanut butter and jelly. I mean, you just, one, one goes with the other. Oh well, here we go again. Ah. Break my elbow in the process, tight as they are. Oh, holy moly. Ah, mother. They say you're never supposed to do this, but. Ah, guy could strain his milk on that one. You know, if I had a real production crew, they'd change this tire for me. But no. Oh, Newberg, he's got to do all of his own tire changing. Got to cook my own meals, wash my own dishes, gut and gill my own critters. Now this is how most people hunt, you know? It, it wouldn't be a hunting trip without at least one nail or bad deal. I have a high lift jack, but I'm too lazy to dig it out. So I'll use, we'll call this the low lift jack then. Oh yeah. Am I going the right way? That thing just keeps sinking down in that dirt. Should put a rock under there, Randy. It's amazing, these tires got 50 some thousand miles on them. And then some jerk's gotta put a sheetrock screw out here in the middle of some place. When you run with me, you keep that spare handy because you know you're gonna need it. Come on, you blankety blank. If I was allowed to swear, it'd go a lot easier. This is the part you never see on an elk hunting TV show. That's because those other TV shows are a bunch of pussies. They have someone else do this stuff for them. The way I look at it, to get an elk, you pretty much got to have one flat tire. About one, one mechanical failure per elk is kind of the ratio it works out to be. Oh yeah. Look at that, huh? <laughs> After you fix a flat tire, you need a little bit of energy. Nothing better than a PBJ. A uh, cinnamon and raisin bagel. So we fix that one. We drive back into Magdalena. We uh, stop by the tire store again, and the same two old boys are there. He said, You believe me now? I'm like, what? He said, you can't get a screw in your tire like that just by random. He's like, someone doesn't want you hunting there. I'm like, I still don't believe that. I just think it was bad luck. But anyhow, uh, while they're fixing the tire, Lauren says, you want to go get a bite to eat? I said, nope. I'm doing peanut butter and jelly. I just couldn't build up the courage to go over there and admit that I was a candy ass who couldn't handle two alarm chili. And so we went out that evening, didn't see much, didn't really have any action. The next day we changed location, went to another spot, saw some elk on a far ridge. I'm usually pretty enthusiastic about getting after it and uh, I don't care if it's steep, if it's far, I just put my head down and off we go. But what he wanted me to do, I could not physically do. I cannot lift my legs to that direction as raw as my bottom side is. We're gonna have to take the easier route. Wish me luck, I'm gonna need it. So we did that and we let him bed. It was a young bull, uh, probably a three and a half year old bull with a group of cows. And by the time we got there, they were gone. And then we had one day left and we went out and we start walking towards this spot and a bull bugle is like right in front of us. So 
I started doing a little bit of cow calling and here comes this younger bull, but it didn't sound, it came from a slightly different direction than the bugle did. I think it was a small satellite bull. And he walked off and then we start following those bugles and then we got pinned down in just the terrible, thick pinion juniper the rest of the day. With that bull, 75 yards at most in front of us, with his cows, you could hear some cow calling, and he would bugle once in a while from his bed. And I just thought, well, this is my last chance. This guy, well, I think it might be the big one that we're trying to get in on. I don't think it's him, but I've only got an hour left, so I don't have any choice but to go chase that bugle. And eventually he just drifted off. They won this time, but not next time. May peace be with you, Elk. I had a lot of time to reflect about that hunt, the elk hunt that went awry. If I look back on it, I'm gonna blame this on the camera guy. If the camera guy hadn't quit, we would have been hunting that first morning. I probably would have killed that big bull that I found scouting the first morning, or this is what I'm saying anyhow. But then I wouldn't have come out to a flat tire right at noon that caused me to go to the chili joint and get dysentery. But man, that was the best chili I ever ate. I paid for it. If that chili shop, that restaurant was still open in Magdalena, I would go there and I'd order half alarm chili. I, I think I should have went and asked for some sort of transplant in, in my guts or something. Now, when I go to New Mexico and I order chili, and they ask me how hot I want it, you can dial that down a little bit for me. I want to have more future elk hunts in front of me, and if I got struck with this at my age now, nine years later, I might end up Boot Hill over something like that. Here lies Randy Newberg, victim of five alarm chili. Shit himself to death. <laughs> Jonathan, come on, man. We've been through this 20 times. You've heard this story. I told it in the office the other day, and that's what got you guys all excited for me to come and tell this. I wish I had a camera. He can hardly stand up right now. So, <laughs> anyhow, folks, that was the, El the New Mexico elk hunt that never was, or that was, but was pretty shitty in a lot of respects. I don't know if you want any more of these folks with this one and all the personal details that really I didn't need to get into, but was part of what they told me I had to talk about. You probably will never again listen to anything I say. And you will turn the TV off or the computer off and say, how did that guy get a job of sitting in front of a camera saying anything? How is it that we're supposed to believe anything he says about killing out? He can't even eat chili. If you see me in my pack with an extra roll of TP, now you know why. I, it's kind of like my security blanket at this point in my life. Stay well.